Now, if you've ever wondered how a tiny little piece of tissue can tell a life or death story under a microscope, then you really need to understand the process that makes it all possible. Today, we're digging into the absolute cornerstone of histopathology, the science of tissue fixation. We've broken this down into four key sections for you. We're going to start with why fixation is so incredibly critical. Then we'll get into the chemistry of how it actually works. From there, we'll look at the practical, hands-on methods used in the lab, and we'll wrap it all up by distilling everything into the core principles for achieving true excellence. Think of it as a journey from the basic concept to total mastery. So let's jump right in with section one, the foundational imperative. And look, I really can't overstate this. In histopathology, if you mess up this first step, nothing else you do is going to matter. The most amazing technician and the most brilliant pathologist in the world can't rescue a badly fixed specimen. It's that important. At its core, tissue fixation is basically the process of hitting pause on life, but at a cellular level. It's an irreversible chemical change that just locks everything in place, preserving the tissue exactly as it was inside the body. This isn't just some prep step, it's the absolute non-negotiable foundation for every single diagnosis that comes after it. This right here is a fantastic analogy to help you really grasp the concept. Just imagine a cell's proteins are like a door that can swing open and shut always changing position. Well, fixation is the act of basically welding that door shut. It permanently alters and stabilizes that molecular structure, making it tough and resistant to the forces of decay. It's a really simple image for a very powerful chemical process. So what are we actually trying to achieve here? Well, there are four main goals. First, we have to stop decay, plain and simple. That means stopping autolysis, where the tissue's own enzymes start breaking it down from the inside out and preventing putrefaction from bacteria. Second, we have to preserve the tissue's physical shape, its morphology, so the cells stay exactly where they're supposed to be. Third, fixation actually makes the tissue more receptive to dyes and stains, which is what creates that beautiful contrast we need for diagnosis. And finally, it takes soft, fragile tissue and makes it firm, so we can actually handle it and slice it into incredibly thin sections. Okay, so this all sounds great in theory, right? But it really begs the question, how do we pull this off, you know, way down at the molecular level? And that question leads us perfectly into our next section. All right, welcome to section two, mechanisms of action. Now we're gonna put on our chemistry hats for a bit to understand the really elegant molecular processes that make all of this possible. The whole entire process really hinges on one single concept, protein denaturation. In simple terms, fixatives take the soluble, almost liquid-like proteins inside our cells and they transform them into insoluble, solid structures. This change is what stops them from just dissolving away during later steps, creating a permanent, readable scaffold of the cell's architecture. Now, there are two main ways we can do this chemically. The first is called additive fixation. In this case, the fixative molecule itself literally adds to the tissue, creating chemical bridges or crosslinks between proteins. You can think of it like injecting a super fast acting glue into the cellular framework. This physically stabilizes everything. The classic examples here are formaldehyde and glutaraldehyde. One key thing to remember is that this process can change the electrical charge of the proteins, which has a big impact on how stains will stick to the tissue later. The second mechanism is non-additive fixation. Now, instead of adding itself to the tissue, this kind of fixative works by removing water. This dehydration forces the proteins to basically fall out of their soluble state and precipitate or crash out of solution and become solid. The fixative itself doesn't become part of the final structure, it just changes the environment. Alcohols like ethanol and acetone are the big players here, and they work through this completely different coagulating action. These different chemical actions create some pretty profound physical differences in the tissue. And this brings us to one of the most brilliant analogies in all of histology. I want you to imagine trying to pour water into two different things. One is a porous mesh ball, and the other is a solid block of gelatin. This perfectly illustrates the physical difference between our next two concepts. This is the result of those chemical actions we just talked about. Coagulant fixatives, like the alcohols, create that mesh ball, a permeable network of proteins that lets later solutions, like dehydrants and paraffin wax, get in super easily. On the other hand, non-coagulant fixatives, like formaldehyde, create the gelatin, a dense gel that makes it much, much harder for other solutions to penetrate. Now, this isn't just some academic detail. It has massive, real-world implications for how long processing takes and the overall quality of the final slide. Okay. 
So we've covered the chemistry and the physics behind this, but how does this all actually get applied day to day in a real lab setting? And that brings us right to section three, methods and protocols. This is where we bridge that gap between the theory and the actual hands-on techniques that professionals use to get tissue ready for diagnosis. First up, let's just briefly touch on physical methods which don't use chemical liquids. Heat fixation, usually with a very carefully controlled microwave, uses thermal energy to denature proteins incredibly fast. Desiccation is even simpler, it's just air drying. Now, this would be a total disaster for a solid piece of tissue, but it's actually the perfect standard method for fixing a single layer of cells, like in a blood smear or a touch prep on a glass slide. When you're using heat, precision is everything. I want you to remember this number, 68 degrees Celsius. That is the absolute maximum temperature for microwave fixation. If you go even a single degree over that, you cause irreversible damage. You're essentially cooking the cell's nucleus, and that makes a sample completely useless for diagnosis. So while those physical methods definitely have their specific uses, the gold standard for pretty much all surgical and autopsy tissues is chemical fixation. This is the process we all know, simply immersing a tissue specimen into a container filled with a liquid fixative. It's the workhorse of every single histopathology lab in the world. But hey, just because it's simple doesn't mean it's easy. Success depends entirely on controlling a set of key variables. You have to choose the right fixative, use the correct ratio of fixative to tissue, fix for the right amount of time, control the temperature, and make sure the tissue isn't too thick for the fixative to penetrate all the way through. Mastering these variables is really the art and science of the job. And here is another critical number for you. This ratio, 10 to 1, is the bare minimum volume of fixative you need compared to the volume of the tissue. If you use any less, you risk incomplete fixation, where the core of the tissue just starts to rot and that leads to a disastrous diagnostic result. In fact, a lot of labs aim for a 20 to 1 ratio just to be on the safe side. Let's see how this all comes together in the real world. Imagine a small skin biopsy arrives in the lab. The protocol is immediate. Place it into a container of 10% neutral buffered formalin. You visually check to make sure that the container has at least 10 times the volume of fixative as the tissue. Then it's sealed up and left for anywhere from six to 24 hours at room temperature. This one simple routine process perfectly brings together all the principles of fixative choice, volume, time, and temperature we've just been talking about. And that brings us to our final section where we're going to distill all this technical info into the core wisdom that really defines high quality work. This is section four, principles for excellence. See, mastery isn't just about following the rules. It's about knowing when the rules change. For example, some tissues like the pancreas are just packed with digestive enzymes they will self-destruct almost instantly, so they need immediate fixation. Second, the very act of chemical cross-linking can sometimes hide the molecular targets or antigens that we need to see with special stains. This means we have to use antigen retrieval techniques later to unmask them. We've already talked about the third point, the irreversible damage from overheating with microwaves. And finally, it's so important to remember that standard, water-based fixatives like formalin do a terrible job of preserving fats or lipids. They just get washed out during processing and need totally different protocols. So, after all of that, what are the three big takeaways? What should you really remember? First, the main goal is always stabilization, to stop decay and preserve the tissue in a lifelike state. Second, the mechanism you choose, whether it's additive or non-additive, coagulant or non-coagulant, is going to determine everything that comes after it. And third, quality is never an accident. It's the direct result of mastering those key variables of fixative, volume, and time.